Today I'm going to talk to you about um, labelling for fluorescence microscopy um, and then a bit about light sheet. Uh, but I'm, I'm Ben from uh, the LMB Light Microscopy Facility and I work together with uh, Nick, John, Jerome and James uh, helping people do their microscopy correctly at the LMB. Um, so first of all, I'll talk a bit about labelling for fluorescence microscopy. So why would you want to actually label a protein with a fluorescent marker. Well, it gives you um, immense uh, specificity and sensitivity. So here you can see microtubules labeled uh, and they're, they're all clearly visible um, in this muscle, heart muscle myocyte. You wouldn't be able to see this fine structure if you didn't label them here with um, this uh, GFP. Uh, they allow you to multiplex. So you can look at different things with high contrast within the cell. So um, here we've got a um, mitotic spindle in blue and in red, um, the kinetico in green, and then the chromatin in blue. And you can visualize the placement of all these items within the cell uh, with high um, spatial resolution if you use fluorescent labels. This is very hard to see if you were not using um, fluorescent labels in the cell. And you can also label in tissues. Here we've got a breast cancer section uh, labeled with uh, four colors. So here, daffy in blue, um, cytokeratin in green, fermentin in yellow, and the ER in red. And this allows you to just look and see where different um, components of the, of the tissue are all um, lining up to, to help that tissue function. And so it allows to, you to look at localization and interaction. So are things actually close together and could they be interacting with each other? how would you go about doing this? So the most uh, important and readily accessible technique is immunolabeling. And this is called immunohistochemistry uh, in tissues and immunocytochemistry in, in cultured cells. And it requires um, antibodies directed against your protein of interest. And these can be monoclonal, so directed against a single epitope within the protein. And they're very specific or polyclonal, where they recognize multiple different epitopes in the protein of interest. Uh, so these can also sometimes bind non-specific targets, the polyclonal antibodies. Um, I'm gonna give you a bit of information about fixation methods and why they might be important for, for uh, antibody recognition. And for antibodies to work, if you've got intracellular proteins, you need to permeabilize your tissue and your cells. Otherwise, you can't get the antibody uh, through uh, the plasma membrane. And there are two principal methods for antibody staining. We have a direct method where your primary antibody directed against the protein of interest is fluorescently, uh, has conjugated fluorescence um, moieties uh, currently bound to it. So you don't need any extra um, secondary antibody to, to, to be able to see where your uh, protein is because the primary antibody is visible by fluorescence. This is your more certain of specificity here because you haven't got a secondary um, effect, uh, maybe giving you cross reactivity with other proteins, and you get quicker staining because you only have one labeling step. There's also an indirect method which is more commonly used. Here you have an unlabeled primary antibody against your protein of interest, and then you have a secondary antibody, this blue one here, which is fluorescently labeled. And this secondary antibody is um, raised uh, in the uh, animal where the primary antibody was, was raised. So it's directed against, for instance, goat, if you have your primary antibody raised um, made in goat, or directed against mouse if the primary antibody was made in, um, raised in mouse. Um, these are polyclonal, so they bind to multiple different um, locations on the, on the primary antibody. So you can have more than one secondary antibody binding to the primary and give you signal amplification. They're more convenient because you can have different colors. Um, so you could have, you could label your primary antibody one day with a green secondary or with a red secondary another day, and you can multiplex um, more easily that way. If you did it all with the direct labeling method, it would become very expensive if you needed to have a primary antibody conjugated to a fluorophore of each color, you end up having many different primary antibodies and primary antibodies are generally um, harder to make and more expensive to produce. 
So you need to fix your cells if you're going to be labeling them with primary antibodies in order to immobilize the cellular macromolecules and retain the subcellular structure so that you can see where things are in relation to other uh, proteins in the cell. Um, and it also permits access of antibodies to their target antigens. But if you fix too long uh, with the cross-linking type of, of, of uh, fixatives, you can actually cause a problem and, and um, prevent the antigen from being presented to the, to the primary antibody. So the, the amount of time you fix for is actually quite important. And there are two different types. There's organic solvents and cross-linking. So organic solvents are alcohols and methanol, ethanol and, and acetone. These remove lipids, they dehydrate the cells. So they do change the size of the cell somewhat. Um, they're good, they give good antibody accessibility and epitope presentation. Um, but because they change the size of the cell, you can't really use them for getting accurate spatial information. Uh, Crosslinkers are much better at preserving the uh, subcellular architecture in the cell and, and um, keeping the cell the same size as it was when it was living. They chemically cross-link all the different proteins together. Uh, the only problem is here, you need to, you have to permeabilize the cell so that you can get the proteins inside. Um, and if you fix for too long, you can food the uh, access to the intracellular antigens if you, you fix too much. So the most suitable fixation method is gonna depend on what you're trying to detect and where it is. Uh, and if you're buying using commercial antibodies, the antibody data sheet will give you information on how to actually, what to fix with and how long. Um, and if it's not in commercial, you might need to do a, a, a range of test conditions or um, consult papers or previous groups that have used it. So word of mouth can be quite useful in that regard. So what's an antibody actually look like? Well, this is a conventional antibody, an IgG. Um, there's 150 kilodaltons in size, so it's quite large. It's got a heavy chain down the bottom here, and then two light chains. And it's the light chains that have the antibody recognition site, so this star. So this is what's actually recognizing the part of your protein. Um, this is in a variable domain, so this domain changes uh, frequently, depending on what the antigen is, uh, whereas the rest of the antibody remains pretty constant. This head region is called the fab, and you can cleave that off and have just a fab fragment. Um, so you can have a, essentially a smaller antibody, which is only 50 kilodaltons. These have an advantage in that they penetrate um, more readily into cells because they're smaller, so they can get in there more quickly and get deeper. So but good for tissue labeling. Um, and they're also good because they only label one antigen. So here with the with your IgG, you're going to be cross-linking two together. Um, so it could change the, potentially change the position in the cell. Um, whereas this one, you know you're labeling one, one antigen. So if it's a monoclonal, it's one, one protein labeled with your, with your antibody here. You can go one step smaller and just have the um, single chain variable fragment, which is 25 kilodaltons. Um, these aren't typically used because they're just harder to produce. But they are much smaller if you need to label things um, in even bigger tissue. Uh, it's not just IgGs, we've also got the camelid IgG. Uh, these are smaller, uh, 95 kilodaltons, and these come from some camels, uh, alpacas, etc. Um, and they again, they have two antibody recognition sites on their um, variable domain, and you can cleave this variable domain off and end up with a nanobody. So nanobodies are very small. 12 to 15 kilodaltons and only two nanometers in size. Um, so they can very readily get to your protein of interest inside uh, tissues. They're also, because they're very small, they're very good for super resolution because they don't add much size to your uh, protein when you're labeling it. And John um, is going to talk a bit more about that when he does the super resolution talk next Thursday. So these small uh, fragments here they just have better access to the antigen and you also you can get greater labeling density if you're sort of if you're labeling microtubules you can get more of these next to each other and therefore get um, higher density of labeling which is ideal for super resolution microscopy. So once you've got an antibody towards the protein how are you going to visualize that antibody typically this is done 
using uh, fluorescent organic dyes, which are fused to the secondary or the, or the primary antibody. And early versions of these were the, the fluorescein and, and rhodamine. These were low photostability um, moiety and also pH sensitive. So it, they were quite difficult to work with. Um, and they can exhibit quenching, for instance, rhodamine if it dimerizes, it, it quenches itself. The modern dyes, which were developed in the last 20, 15, 20 years, they've been, they are much, much better. You have a much greater coverage of the visible spectrum. Um, they're much more stable and they're very bright and resistant to, to photo bleaching. So things like the Bodipi dyes, cyanine dyes, Cy3, Cy5, etc. the Atto dyes and the Alexa Pro series. So the Atto and Alexa, there are many different um, flavors of different, um, with different um, wavelengths of emission. Or actually, sorry, these are the wavelengths of excitation. And these are very small, so about one nanometer. So again, they're not going to add much size to your to your secondary antibody when you, when you start fusing these two. You can also use a quantum dot. So you can add that to your secondary antibody. These are inorganic fluorescent nanoparticles ranging from about two to 50 nanometers in size. And they have a dense heavy metal core and then various shells and it's the outer shell, which is bioactive, and you can, um, can uh, fuse that or couple that to your secondary antibody or to um, different peptides or lipids. These are very bright and highly photostable, so they're, uh, they're good for use in microscopy. You can keep imaging them and they don't, they don't leak that much. They have a very large absorb absorption range, so you can excite them with um, multiple different laser lines. And then they have very tight emission spectra, very narrow tight emission spectra, so you can uh, multiplex quite nicely with them. Um, one additional feature is that they're electron dense because they've got this heavy metal core, so you can use them for correlative fluorescence and electron uh, microscopy, which is becoming more and more commonplace these days. Um, you can functionalize them for this, uh, by adding extra things to the, to the outer shell. But this can significantly increase their size, uh, which can affect um, how they are uh, getting into confined spaces. So it would be difficult to label the vesicles or inside a vesicle or, or at the synapse if you're using a highly modified quantum dot. Um, disadvantages are that they may exhibit blinking, so they're not going to be that good for live imaging. So they might be there in one frame, but not in the next. And they have a high propensity for aggregation. Um, so they can be used wisely. If you don't have an antibody towards a protein that you're interested in, then you can use an epitope tag. Um, this involves making a, a construct where you add an epitope tag sequence to the end of, a, of your protein of interest and transfect that into your, into your, into your cells. And then you can label that, that tag which could be a flag tag, a HA tag, V5, or MIC tag, for instance. You can label those with commercially available antibodies. Um, the advantage of that is that the, these commercially available antibodies are extremely high affinity. So you get very little uh, cross reactions with anything else, and they're very easy to use because they're, they're very specific for the, for the epitope of interest. Um, so this would be, you can use that if you don't have a, a uh, an antibody. Uh, you can also use other methods. So if you don't want to use antibodies, um, you can use all these different methods here. So first of all, I'm going to talk about fluorescently labeling your protein directly. So you, in order to fluorescently label a protein of interest directly, uh, you need to have, well, one way to do it would be to have purified protein at high concentration, and then you can use reactive groups on that protein to label it with uh, different um, fluorophores that I mentioned earlier. So the common reactive groups are isothiocyanite derivatives, such as fluorocene, isothiocyanite, or FITSI, and there's also TRITSI, and these react with primary amines, so lysine side chains. There's also succinyl esters, which um, react to primary amines 
um, again. And these are actually preferred to the ISOs, thiocyanate um, derivatives due to their higher specificity and more stable linkage. And there's also, you can label um, cysteine side chains using uh, malamide activated fluorophores, such as fluorocene 5 uh, malamide. Um, the problem is with these are that you can have over labeling of the protein, and this can cause precipitation out of the solution. Uh, so you need to optimize your conditions. And following the labeling reaction, it's necessary to move all the unreacted chlorophyll, otherwise you get a huge amount of background. Um, and this is usually accomplished by the size exclusion chromatography. But when would you actually use these? Well, you could use them in cuvette-based fluorescence measurements, uh, in vitro reconstitution experiments, and also you can introduce them into living cells by microinjection and, and see where they go. Um, another way of labeling different parts of the cell is to use compartment dyes. Uh, so there are various different ones of these. We've got fluorescent ceramide analogs, which label the Golgi, and there's various different colors of those. You can use in live cell or fixed. Um, there's lyso tracker for labeling the lysosome, ER tracker, and various other e trackers, as we'll see. For labeling the endoplasmic reticulum, and these are all come in various colors. Mitre tracker as well. There's dye eye, so this you would inject into the cell and it tracks along the uh, plasma membrane, so very useful for labeling the entire cell uh, and all its processes, like these hippocampal neurons here. And there's also tubulin tracker for labeling uh, tubulin in live, in live cells. You also make use of high affinity natural interactions, such as this vitamin binding. So streptavidin um, binding to biotin is one of the most um, high affinity reactions or, or um, high affinity recognitions in, uh, in biology. So once this is bound to each other, you don't tend to, to lose it. And it's very good for improving uh, signal to noise. So if you have a very low expressed uh, protein and you want to boost the signal of it so you can see it and you're not doing super resolution, then you can use a, a strip covered in a biotin um, secondary to uh, increase the signal. There are also um, paclitaxel derivatives to label microtubules. So most, a lot of people may have heard of sirtubulin already because it's quite commonly used now. Um, this is good and you can use it in live cells or thereafter some time it uh, can cause problems with, with uh, in the cell and um, particularly with cell division and also if you don't keep a, a certain amount in solution you lose your labeling as it's only associates with microtubules and after time they disassociate. Uh, Phalloidin conjugates used to label actin uh, these should be used with care because they're very toxic and you can also use alpha bungalotoxin to label acetylcholine receptors um, under the synapses. And these are high, very high affinity reactions. Um, you can also fuse a fluorescent protein to your protein of interest. So similarly to how you would fuse a, an epitope tag um, to use a um, um, high affinity commercial antibody, you can also use a fluorescent protein and you don't need to use an antibody. So these are genetically encoded um, between 27 and 35 kilodaltons. And that it gives you perfect specificity because you know that where that protein, where that fluorescent protein is, is where your son, where your protein of interest is. It often requires you to do um, some cloning to tag your protein with the, with the fluorescent protein and then transfect or electroporate that into your um, cells of interest. You can also use binary expression systems um, like GAL4 and UAS, commonly used in, in Drosophila um, and yeast. You can also now tag your protein with CRISPR and Cas9. So these approaches above, they mean that the wild type protein is present. So this can sometimes not be ideal uh, because you don't know how much of the um, exogenous protein you're expressing and how it's going to affect the function of the of the wild type protein. So using CRISPR-Cas9, you can tag the endogenous protein at, at uh, endogenous levels. 
and visualize where, where it is within the cell. So as long as you put it in a place that's not going to affect the protein function, this can work very nicely. So the first of these was discovered in Acoria Victoria, the jellyfish, uh, where GFP was discovered. And from GFP, um, various derivatives were, were made. So the BFP, CFP for blue and cyan and, and YFP. Um, and then later, MRFP was discovered in this coral, this chrysoma. And from RFP, we've got many different um, fluorescent proteins going off into the far red. So these give you great um, options for multiplexing and labeling or tagging different proteins within the cell and looking at them using light imaging. So near infrared proteins also uh, come from bacterial phytochrome. Uh, so GFP and RFP have this beta barrel which surrounds the chromophore, which is in the middle, which is the actual part that is responsible for the fluorescence. And this beta barrel protect, protects it from pH changes. So they're, they're very useful in, um, for live imaging. You can also tag your proteins with optical highlighter fluorescent proteins. So these uh, are um, uh, mutations of the GFP to result in it being photoactivatable. So here you would um, shine a particular wavelength of light onto your uh, dark protein, and then you see it uh, starting to fluoresce in, in green. And then you can monitor where that goes within the cell. So if it's a, on a mobile protein that moves around, you may see it diffused throughout the cell. And after PAGFP, there are many um, extra derivatives of this made that were more um, better, easier to work with because the first PAGFP was very difficult. It was actually imaging the GFP, it was activating the silent um, uh, unactivated GFP. So after a while, you end up just activating the whole cell. And then that was greatly improved in, in, in uh, later um, iterations. And then there's an RFP version from um, Cherry. Uh, so you can do different colors. Uh, there are photoconvertible fluorescent proteins. So these um, can be shifted in wavelength to a longer wavelength emission. emission. So they start off green, for instance, you then target them with a um, four or five light and it'll turn red. And then you can see where that red protein goes in relation to the green. And they all go from green to red. Uh, and then we go red to green. Um, there's photo switchable fluorescent proteins. So these you can reversibly switch on or off, on and off the illumination with specific wavelengths. Um, so here you've got your protein fluorescing in green. You can then turn it off and then turn it back on again with another wavelength of light. So these were used in or are used in palm, um, which is like a super resolution technique. Um, that are, relies on the blinking of fluorophores and here you can turn them on and off so you can activate blinking by flashing with one color of light and then flashing with another um, and imaging which, which um, proteins are fluorescing at one time. There's also iris fluorescent protein which is photoconvertible and photo switchable so it's got a function of both so once you've turned it from green to red you can then cycle it on and off. Um, and as I mentioned these are good for looking at protein dynamics and uh, where they move around within the cell and also uh, super resolution techniques such as palm, which Tom may talk about on Thursday. You can also look at the age of your protein or a protein pool within the cell using these tandem fluorescent timer proteins. So they are a fusion of two um, proteins, a fast uh, maturing and a slow maturing fluorescent protein. So you look at the ratio uh, between the two to work out how old that uh, protein pool is. So here looking in um, cell division in yeast, um, you can see that you get a green and a red um, a spindle and they're of different ages. So the old one is a the red spindle because that matures um, more slowly and the newest one is the green spindle because that matures more quickly. And uh, so you can see which cell is the old cell, which cell is used. You can also look at different stages of cell cycle 
uh, using cell cycle markers, which are exhibiting different colors depending on where you are in the cell cycle. So it's good for, for looking at a whole, whole cell population and seeing which cells are in which state. Um, I mentioned correlative fluorescence and electron microscopy earlier with the um, quantum dots. So there's another fluorescent protein that allows you to do this called mini cell. So this is mini singlet oxygen generator. It's a small 15 kilodalton fluorescent flavor protein from Aridopsis. And it fluoresces in, in the green. And when you image it, it actually starts releasing singlet oxygen, which can be used to locally catalyze the polymerization of diamine benzene, um, which is an insol insoluble osmophilic reaction product then if it, um, resolvable at EM because it becomes electron dense. So you can image it in light microscopy and then take that to the EM and have a look at where that actually is at very high resolution. Um, it permits strong aldehyde fixation uh, with, once you've done the diamine benzene. Um, so it allows you to then look um, in EM and it works in mammalian cells, uh, nematodes, the software on, on rodents. Another way of labeling uh, without antibodies is to use a genetically encoded but non fluorescent tag. So there are two different types of these there's self labeling and then enzyme mediated. So I'll talk about the self labeling um, options. So there's uh, flash and reash. So these are um, were commercialized by Invitrogen. Uh, they're chemical sur surrogates of fluorescent proteins um, and they can be used to be used for labeling living cells. They're membrane permeable. Um, derivatives are fluorescein and resurfin. So fluorescein for the green and resurfin for red. And they're initially non-fluorescent until they bind their tag. Um, and because of this, they, they uh, sorry, they can also react with um, proteins that have a, the tetracysteine tag on them. So because of this, you can get some uh, cross reactivity. If you've got lots of cysteine rich proteins. Uh, they also both bind the same sequence. So they're not very useful for multiplexing with one another and they're toxic for humans. Um, so they, they can be useful in some scenarios, but uh, there are sort of modern alternatives which are uh, more readily used for, um, for loading proteins. And they are uh, chemical labels, SNAP, DIP, and HALO. So these are tags that you fuse to your protein of interest. So there's a SNAP tag and the, and the PIP tag. They're the same size, 20 kilodaltons. And the, uh, the SNAP tag binds to benzyl guanine, um, tagged fluorophores, and then it, it covalently binds the, the fluorophore to the SNAP tag. And the PIP tag, it, the reaction is uh, the clip tag and the uh, benzocytosine, and that prevalently binds the label to the to the clip tag. So these are these um, ligands are very very small, and they can penetrate very quickly into inside um, the cells of interest. So you can do labeling very quickly in, in the order of ten minutes versus two days. You do have to have a transgenic animal in order to do so, or, or a cell line where you engineered it. The protein of interest to have the tag on it, so it's not as if you can just label straight away with a with a primary antibody. Um, but they are they are very good for following things uh, in deep tissue. And nowadays with CRISPR and Cas9, you can tag any endogenous protein you want, uh, and then use chemical labeling to label it. There's also the halo tag, so you can do multiplexing of three. And here you can see there's um, six channel imaging in a, uh, using Brainbow. And then you can also do um, two orthogonal labeling with a different cell populations like this uh, image of the um, olfactory neurons, olfactory receptor neurons, and then the projection neurons in the um, olfactory circuit and stuff. And then there's also enzyme mediated labeling. So it's a little bit harder to work with because you need an enzyme as well as the, the tag and, and the, the ligand. And these are ACP and MCP tags uh, from NMB. They're smaller than SNAP 
uh, different halo tags, only 10 kilodalton. So uh, they would likely disrupt protein function less if that was a problem. They're non cell permeable, so you have to either permeabilize your cells, so these are only fixed cells, or only label proteins on the cell surface. And they're fluorescently conjugated substrates. Um, they will label both ACP and MCP tags. So the specificity is determined by the enzyme, the synthase that you use to catalyze your reaction. So ACP synthase will modify predominantly the ACP tag, whereas S F SFC F no, SFP synthase will label both the ACP and the MCP tag. Therefore, you've got to do sequ sequential incubation um, if you want to get dual color labeling. And there's a very limited emission rate and also a spectra here. You've only got three, you know, green and orange and, and a red one to choose from, whereas other, other approaches have uh, more options for, for colors. So next I'm gonna just talk about the last approach for labeling without antibodies, so bioorthogonal labeling. Uh, this um, works by introducing an unnatural amino acid into your target protein, which can then be labeled by fluorophore. And lots of work has been done on this here at the, at the LMB by um, Jason Chin. So in order for this to happen, you need to engineer the sequence of your protein of interest so that it contains the UAG codon in the mRNA at the site you want to add your tag. You then have to express an orthogonal amino acid tRNA synthetase and a tRNA pair, either from trans a transfective plasmid or um, by creating a transgenic animal. You then feed the unnatural amino acid to uh, the, the cell or the organism, and the um, orthogonal T, orthogonal synthetase and tRNA pair will incorporate the unnatural amino acid into the protein of interest. You can then um, label that uh, protein of interest um, because it has a tetra, tetracine linker attached to it, and then you can have a quent, which has a quent fluorophore, and that labels to the um, uh, unnatural amino acid and then becomes fluorescence. So you can see uh, where your protein of interest is. And you can tightly control, you can tightly control the amount of protein that, that you label by controlling how much of the unnatural amino acid you feed to the organism or apply to the cells. So it can be very flexible and a powerful technique. So in summary, I've told you about um, the fact that you can do multiplexing with fluorescent labeling and it gives you high specificity and sensitivity in fixed samples. Um, and the chosen fixation method is important for this to work properly. If you wanna look in live cell, there are many different um, compartment dyes that work in live cells and also fluorescent proteins are very powerful for this. And that you can also do rapid chemical labeling in thick tissues with the different approaches of color. So now I'm gonna tell you a bit about um, light sheet microscopy and what possibilities we have for this at the LMB. So to understand light sheet, I'll quickly recap the simple light path of wide field and focal microscopes. So for both wide field and focal, um, we excite and detect through the same um, objective. So this one here. So the excitation light comes in, hits the sample and the emission signal goes up through the same detective um, objective and gets detected on a camera or a PMT, whether it's wide field for a camera or PMT for a confocal. Um, out of focus light in the confocal is rejected by the pinhole. So you get an optical section at the focal plane. Whereas with wide field, you have out of focus light coming from above and below the focal plane. And you can see that there's a sort of blur fuzz on the camera. However, both of these methods result in fluorescence excitation outside the focal plane, so above and below this focal plane, and they can lead to photo bleaching and phototoxicity over time. By contrast, with a light sheet, the illumination and detection are usually done by two different objectives. So you have an illumination objective and then a detection objective. So here, a laser beam is expanded, passed through a cylindrical lens to turn into a line, and this is then 
uh, used to fill the back aperture of the illumination objective, which generates a sheet of light. And this sheet of light is positioned at the, the focal plane or the focal point of this uh, detection objective. Um, and your sample is placed within the sheet. You then image very quickly the entire uh, field of view of the camera, of the, sorry, of the um, detection objective onto the camera. So it's very fast, like wide field, and you can get optical sectioning because you're only illuminating along the uh, focal plane. So you get the optical sectioning that you would see with the focal. So it has the benefits of both of those systems. And you can also, so you can do fast volume imaging by stepping the sample through the light sheet. And you don't get phototoxicity to the same extent as wide field and focal because you're only ever illuminating the sample along that focal plane. So hopefully you can see that from that, that it would be um, very useful to use light sheet microscopy for imaging live samples as it's inherently gentle and fast. Although some systems are faster than others, as I'll, as I'll show you. Um, but you must bear in mind that there's no one light sheet that just fits them all or fits all samples. In fact, um, there are uh, many different light sheets, many more that aren't, than I'll be able to actually talk about in this talk. And there's many more than, the, than they're shown on the screen here. And for this reason, light microscopy um, is not really a type of microscopy anymore. It's just a type of illumination that you use and design the microscope to fit your sample. Um, so this explains why there's so many different acronyms out there. And you can't really now say that you simply use the light sheet microscope for doing your imaging when you're, when you're writing a paper. You really need to define what type you actually use so people can reproduce it easily. So here I'm showing you an example of how gentle light sheet imaging can be. This is a living Drosophila embryo. I'm going through some got peristalsis here. Um, and this was imaged five minutes continuously, 30 frames a second, so 10,000 frames. And there's no bleaching um, of the sample. So I speed up, speeded up the middle section so that you can then see that at the end, it's still the same brightness as it was at the start. And this would have bleached very rapidly on a confocal microscope. Um, this was acquired on a, on a T-spin uh, arrangement. So you've got dual-sided illumination and detection of things that objective here. And it's just one focal plane. Now you can also do very fast cellular imaging and looking at fast cellular dynamics with a light sheet microscope. So on the left, you've, you've got um, human immune cells, these human T cells. And this is one volume um, taken every seven seconds with sequential imaging. And on the right, we've got dynein in mouse different mouse neurons that are differentiated from um, induced purified stem cells. And here we've got one volume taken every actually be one second, so one volume every second um, to a very high speed. And these were taken on um, the subcellular field synthesis light sheet that we have here at the LMB. Uh, and the lenses are arranged in this combination. So it's quite different to the, to the previous um, T spin that I showed you. So here we have a mouse oocyte labeled with tubulin and Hertz, with tubulin in green, Hertz in, in blue. And this sample images really well because it's very, um, it's not very dense. So light penetrates well through the specimen and you don't get that much scatter. Uh, um, and this is probably 140 um, microns in diameter. You can see that this edge is slightly brighter and, and crisper in the back, but you can still see um, spindles of microtubule um, at the back of the, of the specimen in the front. So this was closest to the detection objective. And this was imaged on a T-spin uh, similar to that. So the Drosophila image I showed you earlier. And here we have a mouse um, embryo undergoing development. So this is captured over two days from gastrulation to early organogenesis on a custom uh, dual illumination, uh, dual camera light sheet at Geneva Research Campus called the SIMVIEW. And it's, it's so named because it's got two detection objectives. It simultaneously capture from both 
sides of the sample um, onto canvas. And this is particularly important when you want to look at um, large, dense samples as this ends up being as it develops. Uh, because if you were just imaging from one side, this side would be nicely crisp and this side would be very much out of focus. As you can see in the middle here, you start to lose um, uh, any, any semblance of being able to see any structure in the cell because of scatter effect. I'll talk a bit more about scatter now. But when you're imaging at depth, um, you, you suffer from the scatter of light. So the excitation light scatters through the uh, through the sample and hits different places. And the emission signal is, is scattered as well. So it doesn't all come back out and get captured by the, um, the um, detection objective by following up the straight path to the, to the objective. And therefore, it, you don't know where it's coming from and you end up having a fuzz of light like this. Um, this reduces um, your image quality. So these are two samples here, both imaged from the top. So you can see it's, um, it's more uh, well, it's crisper, more resolvable at the top here. And as you go through and Z, the signal drops off. And the same here, this has got a sparsely labeled the subtle end here. So how can you overcome scatter with a light sheet? I mean, scatter is present in all forms of microscopy. It just with light sheet microscopy, you tend to be looking at larger samples um, because you're doing live imaging of organisms, for instance. And you can do that using multi-view uh, imaging. So that's taking an image from different angles. So here, four different angles, and then fusing to get a, um, using uh, registration software and fusion software, give you one 360 degree um, nicely resolved image. And you can do this with various different software techniques. Uh, we've got two um, at the moment at the LMB. Uh, we can use bead and segmentation based fusion using Fiji or uh, intensity profile as fusion using uh, commercial software for poisons from scientific volume. And I'll show you some examples of how that works now. Um, here there's a Drosophila embryo. So this is one time point of a four hour time lapse, which is imaged every five minutes. So uh, 46 time points overall. Um, the beads here have two functions. They're used as markers to aid the registration of each time point to the next. And also they're used as point sources for AP convolution. Um, so after, over time, you can end up looking at the entire sort of development of salivary glands in Drosophila. Uh, and if you want to, you can 3D render that and look at all time points um, if you have some like a movie. But in, this, uh, in the center here, you can, you can nicely see over time, you get um, you can see sort of cell the cell membranes and how they change over time. And that was this previous one was imaged on a um, prototype system. This was used this system, the size Z one was used to image this uh, kidney organoid, um, finally donated by uh, John JP from from Catch's group. And this is um, three. With three views that were fused using the, the Huygen software, but not without using any beads, so it gives you um, more isotropic resolution uh, throughout the sample, and you can see uh, tubule forming within inside or that are formed within the organ. It's about 350 microns across, so you still can't really see inside the center of these, but you can still resolve the, the outside to get more. To get better depth penetration, you need to use longer wavelengths and um, fluorescent proteins and longer wavelengths than um, chlorophore uh, to do that. Because that aids your the penetration of the, of the antibodies and, and so the light. Uh, at the LMB, we have three custom light sheets. We have the ASLM, which is an actually swept light sheet microscope, the subcellular light sheet, where I showed you the fast cellular dynamics that you saw earlier. And also the OPM, the oblique plane light sheet microscope. But this one's special and it only uses well, it only uses one detection lens. It's not quite yeah, one detection lens, many more lenses. But first, I'm going to talk to you to you a little bit about the thickness of a light sheet, because this is a concept that's important to understand uh, when we talk about the rest of the those three light sheets. So this, the thickness of the light sheet is governed by the numerical aperture or NA, 
of the illumination objective, or particularly how much of the back aperture of the objective you fill with illumination light, um, and therefore how much of the NA of the objective you're actually using. So the lower the NA of the lens, the thicker the sheet is, but the broader it is. So you get a, high, a wider field of view. You can image big, big samples with this. If you want to look at small samples at high resolution, then you need to use a high NA illumination objective to create a, a thinner sheet, but that thinner sheet is, is shorter um, in its usable portion. So I talk, mentioned that we had an ASLM of the LMB. So here's a simplified schematic showing the beam path of the, uh, of the ASLM. It's still being built, but it's almost finished. So the laser beam is expanded to eight millimeters and then it passes through the cylindrical lens and turns into a line, um, which then passes through the electronically tunable lens. I'll talk about that later. Um, and that's relayed onto the mirror galvo, which can flick the beam from the left and right uh, illumination objectives. Um, these are high NA illumination objectives. So the sheet is very is short and thin. Uh, the emission signal is then connect, connected by a high NA detection objective and relayed onto the camera through an emission filter reel uh, by the tube lens. The system is designed to be used in single sided, so if you just use the Galvo to send it one way, or dual sided um, to flip it from either side, and that would be in sync with the, the camera exposure. Um, so that you can end up with. Um, uh, images taken from the left and the right, and then the resulting final image is a fusion of, of both sides. So you might be thinking, why is an ASLM useful? So I haven't talked about that, that ETL um, that I showed on the previous screen in detail yet. Um, so the ETL is used to sweep the, the thin portion of the sheet backwards and forwards across the sample, but why would that be useful? In conventional light sheet microscopy, you have a sheet of light and then you capture the entire um, field of view on to the camera chip. Um, but the central portion of that is only um, illuminated by the thinnest section of the sheet, so giving you highest resolution. That is, as you get to the edges of your sample, you're going to be um, illuminating with a thicker sheet and therefore getting um, less resolution on a slightly fuzzier image. What ASLM does or the, the ETL, what it does is it, it sweeps this thin portion of the sheet backwards and forwards across your sample in time with a rolling shutter on the camera. So you're only ever exposing um, the thin section of sheet or the portion of the sample illuminated by the thin section of sheet onto the camera at any one time. So you only capture from the, the, the highest resolution portion of that white sheet and to give you better resolution. Um, and this can give you very nice results. So here you can see standard light sheet, you've got the central portion looking in focus, and then you get fuzzy image on the left and the right. When you turn it into ASLM mode, you can see that you get nice focused, um, crisp detail across the whole image. It does come with a price, uh, and that's increased light dose. So you're sweeping that light across the, um, the sample in time with the rolling shutter, but you still have to expose each portion of that, um, uh, each portion but for the same amount of time to build up the same image. So if this took 100 milliseconds to take, this may have taken 10 times that, because there might be 10, 10 sections that you end up capturing on, on, the, on the camera. So you end up with an increased light dose, but because light sheet is inherently very gentle, you don't really get an increase in toxicity as a result of that. So this is the custom ASLM at the LMB. This is the actual microscope here, and this is the laser bed. Uh, and looking inside, this is where your sample goes on, a, on a, one of these sample holders uh, through a rotation stage so that you can turn an image from different angles. And we've got left-sided illumination and then right-sided illumination coming in here. It's got a camera so that you can look to see where your sample is and position it in the right place, very useful. Because these, these sort of microscopes don't have eyepieces to find the sample. 
So it's got M to leave two-sided illumination, which gives you more, more even illumination and uh, fewer artifacts because you've got illumination coming from both sides. Um, you can rotate the sample and image from different views. So to try and uh, combat scatter by using um, multi-view and then fusion deconvolution. You can actually sweep the thinner sheet to improve your Z resolution. And there's also an option to bypass that. If you don't want to do um, the user ASLM mode, we can project a uh, longer but thicker sheet across the sample. And then you can just use it as a, as a standard light sheet. It's got four laser lines and I'm adding um, a fifth one. It's got temperature control, sample chamber, and uh, it's intended for organoids, spheroids, and Drosophila embryos. Um, so it's quite a flexible system. So you can run it in dual-sided mode or single-sided mode. And as I said, you can use ASLM or not. Um, one of the keys to light sheet is finding the best way to mount your sample. Um, everything in the ASLM is suspended from above, either in a um, piece of FEP tubing suspended from a syringe or in low melt a column of low melting point agarose. So here we've got an embryo and a column of agarose in the capillary here, and that would be um, dipped into the light sheet. So the key is getting your mounting working properly before you can do the dip the images. Um, there's another custom light sheet in the facility, in the subcellular light sheet, um, which uses field synthesis, field synthesis to generate the light sheet. Um, it achieves the same imaging quality and speed as the free eye lattice light sheet, but it's just much, much more simple. Um, it's best for cells on a cover slip, which is uh, conveniently five millimeters in diameter, so a bit tricky to work with. And the sample sits down here and it's get raised up just underneath these detection the illumination and the detection objective. It's got very high resolution and you can image um, very sensitive uh, samples. So these are dictyostelium, which normally bleach in a matter of seconds um, in a control microscope. And you can image them very, very quickly for very long periods of time on the tip of the light sheet. This has been built um, and is running in a facility built by James Manson. James is also currently building a, he's in the final stages of building the OPM, which is an oblique flame um, light sheet. I don't have a picture of the actual system to show you because it's not finished um, yet. And this has got comparable resolution to the subset of the light sheet that I showed you um, a moment ago. It's just a lot more readily accessible to, um, to users because you can just turn up with whatever sample carrier you like, really. Uh, a cover slip on a slide, a 35 or 50 millimeter imaging dish, or a chamber slide, so the Ubiqui chamber slide, a lab tech chamber slide. Um, I won't go into the details of how it actually works because it is it's very complicated and I don't really have time to do that. But um, essentially, it uses um, various lenses to relay a um, to relay this an image of this sample, and then that gets re-imaged by another lens and then um, imaged onto the camera. So the the single objective is both the sheet forming objective and the detection objective. Um, and you can achieve higher end by doing this to get high resolution images. Um, it's going to have sample incubation and CO2 management, which is commercially um, dealt with. So it's very, um, should be very good for, for live imaging and very fast live imaging as well. Um, so yeah, this is the system, the schematic um, generated by Andrew York's group, showing you pretty much what's going on. You can go to this website and find out more information about it. So in summary, um, I've shown you that there are many ways you can do light sheet, and it's really um, sample dependent as to which technique you choose. Uh, we've tried to pick one that will uh, complement the work going on here at the LMB. Um, it principally allows you to do live cell imaging for much longer due to the less focal toxicity. And with multi view imaging, you can get more isotropic um, resolution, and there are three options. Of light sheet imaging here at the LMB. Okay, so thank you very much for um, your attention.
and I'll take any questions. Chris is asking, can you explain more about the dots used for registration and collecting images at different angles? So these are these are fluorescent beads. So they're the best to use sub diffraction limited beads. So there are used 100 nanometer beads. And they're added to the, um, in this case, the agarose, which is around the organoid, no, sorry, the, um, the embryo. Um, and you add them during mounting the sample. Um, so they're actually physical things that are there. So when you image them from different um, rotations, you have a kind of a constellation that you're imaging at different angles and the software can find all of the, those um, discrete points and map them back onto each other so that you can fuse your angles. You can rotate everything back around and fit it on top of each other. No, they don't, well, it depends on the sample. They, so Chris has also followed up, so they don't diffuse or move during rotation. So no, they stay fixed to the rotation of the, of the, the sample. They're particularly good for Drosophila because, or Drosophila embryo development, because that doesn't change shape or size as you image it over time. If you were imaging something, for instance, the, um, the mouse embryo development, you couldn't really use beads because the beads would just get pushed out of the way over time. So that their position at time point one is going to be different from the next time point because they get pushed out of the way. Um, so there you kind of have to rely on using the um, intensity profile type uh, registration um, if you want to fuse things from either side. So that particular microscope, the sim view, where they did the mouse um, um, embryogenesis, they wrote their own fusion um, pipeline in MATLAB to do that. So that's another thing that kind of happens with, with light sheet microscope. There are generic tools out there to do the fusion and recon reconstruction, but in general, um, you end up having to, to, if you need a specific question answer, you, you have to tackle it yourself or in collaboration with other people. Someone's asking, how do live samples retain their integrity for long-term imaging um, when mounted for um, LSM? So organoids, is they're imaged in a buffer or media. So, um, so the organoids, if you're imaging those with the light sheet microscopy, um, they retain their integrity in an FEP tube. So it's a, a small thin tube, which has got the same refractive index as water. So you, it, it allows the light to pass, pass through it without any um, deviation of the, of the refraction of the light. And in there, you can, you can hold them in suspension in very, very low percentage, low melting point agro, so, so 0.1, 0 0.2%. And that you can make with media to start with. And then you can have a bath of media in the uh, syringe above so that you end up getting nutrient diffusion through that low melting point agro so to keep the sample alive. Um, if you need CO2 as well, then you can bubble CO2 into a external vessel of media and then have fluid exchange between the syringe and the, um, and the, the media buffer. It's not a trivial thing for suspending organoids inside the light sheet like that to, to do the imaging. Um, so you could use the OPM, which has more um, commercial setup for incubation. The problem there is if you're using an organoid, it's quite thick and the OPM you only ever image from one direction so you'd never be able to turn it and look on another side um, and easily be able to register different views. Uh, so it's something you kind of have to just try and see if your organoid survives um, and tweak the conditions as necessary to keep it alive. <laughs>